Thank you very much, and um, thank you, uh, Professor Fust and uh, your whole team for inviting us, uh, giving um, so the first glance about uh, our um, ideas and how to cope with this uh, unprecedented crisis we are facing now, uh, at least in Europe, since um, uh, at least March this year with um, uh, lockdowns in general in, in, in spring, and now due to the second wave, uh, uh, another. Uh, lockdown with different uh, um, levels in, in the different member states. But in general, I would say we have learned a lot uh, from this uh, first wave, how to address this, how to coordinate things. Uh, I have to say again, uh, um, against uh, maybe different um, 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 different uh, um, perceptions, uh, the union is not in charge of any um, um, any issue related to health. Uh, uh, this is something which is with the member states. And if, as you can see, for instance, in Germany, but in other countries, for instance, the one I know best, uh, this is not even at the level uh, of uh, the federal state, but also at the region of municipalities. That's why you had uh, at the beginning very, let's say, heterogeneous uh, um, answers, uh, how to cope with this crisis, how to react, etc. And of course, uh, now in the meantime, uh, I think we have found ways uh, uh, to, to, to address uh, um, certain issues and in particular areas where um, European coordination is needed. And as you can see in the, in the past few days, a lot of progress has been made, for instance, on the purchase of potential vaccines. This is clearly an area where only European cooperation and uh, coordination leads to a, um, um, so say a result which is in the interest of uh, each and everybody. Maybe we will come back to this in the in the Q&A session. Uh, but I would uh, go a little bit, walk you through uh, what we have done in, in terms of uh, the budgetary and financial means of the union. Of course, um, everything happened. Uh, or started just when we were negotiating uh, the usual, if I may say so, multi-annual financial framework. Um, there was a European Council in February which failed um, amongst insiders and knowledgeable people. This was not really unexpected because usually heads of states need at least two European Council to agree on something um, essential like a multi-annual financial um, uh, framework. But to a certain extent, it was a luck because a few days later, um, the whole crisis, uh, um, so to say, um, popped up uh, in Europe with all the consequences, and that, that uh, and this uh, immediately led to a total um, uh, rehauling of uh, the and overhauling of the of uh, our budgetary structure, and we had immediately. Uh, been tasked uh, by the European Council to look into the potential consequences. Of course, in March, April, things were even more unclear than it is uh, today. But even at that time, we um, identified, and this was, uh, I think, shared by many researchers, academics, and experts, that uh, potentially there is an ex expected investment gap in 2021 and 2022 of at least 1.5 trillion euro and there might be equity losses resulting from lower profits in 2020 and 2021 in a range between 700 billion and 1.2 trillion uh, uh, with of course severe consequences in particular in sectors like tourism and transport and we should not uh, underestimate the relevance of tourism i think tourism is the third biggest uh, sector in the European Union, very much um, underestimated also on our European level because, for instance, on tourism we have uh, also no competences and that this is why uh, many people at the European Commission are not really dealing with this and uh, looking at uh, tourism probably only from a private angle but not from a uh, business uh, angle. This has dramatically changed uh, and I'm grateful for this because uh, 
coming from a country which is very much uh, depending on, on, on tourism. I was also in my previous capacity as commissioner for structural funds very much pushing to invest in in the in the further modernization and adaptations of uh, the tourism sector. But this is another story. The point is that we have identified the needs and we were looking at uh, uh, certain uh, answers and it was clear we had to find an unprecedented answer to an unprecedented situation because since the end of World War II, we haven't seen such a steep decline of the economy and uh, such uh, big changes. Um, I mean, different to the financial and economic crisis more than 10 years ago, now the, the, so the, the so-called real sector was very much uh, hit. And, and by the way, we also identified a need of almost 200 uh, billion per year for the um, um, health sector, but also the education and lifelong um, uh, sector. Uh, and um, uh, this is also something we have to address. And as a result of all this, we proposed in April um, um, a new, so to say, budget structure for the next seven years, which is actually split into two parts. The first part for the first three, four years out of the seven is more or less dedicated to react, to response, and to cope with all the effects of the crisis. And then, of course, we have to see, so to say, the, 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 all the seven years in a way which is also in line with our political priorities. So the challenge was to react to the crisis, but not to depart from our political priorities. And this are particularly the Green Deal uh, to address climate change, but also uh, digitalization. And this uh, ideally should uh, come together, should converge, if you like. And um, as a result of this, we proposed a recovery and resilience fund. And it's important uh, to stress the second part, resilience. So it's not only about um, reacting and, and quasi healing uh, uh, the damages and uh, the effects of the crisis, but using also the crisis uh, to make our economies more resilient than it was, uh, than it is the case today. Also, we have to see, of course, um, amongst member states, we have those who are less vulnerable and those who are more vulnerable. And of course, for the future, we would like to reduce the number of those who are more vulnerable and more exposed to potential crisis, or at least to reduce um, um, the risk potential and to be better prepared because there will be another crisis. Uh, we don't know exactly when, but uh, there will be certainly sooner or later another crisis and it's about to be better prepared. And on the other hand, uh -huh. hello, can you still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. It's all but, fine. Uh, and can you see me? Because yes. everything has disappeared. Everything has, sorry, well. has disappeared from my, from my um, uh, screen, but I will continue. Yes, uh, so uh, what we um, uh, proposed finally was um, a, a new MFF, which consists of the core MFF, which is now after the negotiations with the European Parliament, um, uh, 1,090 uh, billions for seven years. And on top, we have a new instrument, which we call Next Generation EU, which uh, is something where the union is ready to borrow money at the market uh, in order to provide it uh, to our member states. And this 750, as probably most or probably all of you know, has been split into two parts. One is um, a loan uh, part of 360, and the other one is a grant part of 390 billion. Uh, the biggest uh, part of this uh, 390, 312.5 should be uh, um, uh, used for the setup of a so-called um, uh, recovery and resilience fund. I will come to it a little bit later. And uh, the remaining amount is uh, used to uh, create a special instrument, REACT-EU, 
which is in particular um, there in order to react quickly and even retroactively uh, to the, um, uh, so say, financial costs of uh, the current crisis. So this instrument will only be available for the first two years, 2021 and 2022, with around 45 billion euros. But uh, so say costs related to the COVID crisis uh, can already, um, uh, or, or bills can already be uh, submitted and um, it, uh, this instrument will, once everything is uh, agreed and adopted, uh, uh, apply retroactively uh, by the beginning of February this year. And the, the remaining difference uh, uh, is there to reinforce existing uh, European programs like Horizon, like InvestEU and um, uh, some other areas. Uh, so this is what we are what we have proposed, and I think in financial terms, I'm now um, very often asked if I believe uh, facing potentially a third wave, this might be sufficient enough. I think it is sufficient enough. Uh, I think for the time being, there is um, uh, member states are rather liquid. I can see it uh, if we are discussing the, the different dates for potential issuances of bonds, etc. that there is uh, currently some liquidity, but we have to see how this um, evolves in the future. Maybe I should also mention that uh, before we are doing this, there was a quick reaction by member states, but also by the European Parliament, and we have uh, set up a package of different measures worth uh, for, uh, 540 millions um, uh, in order to address the immediate needs uh, uh, stemming from this crisis, and this was already be done in spring this year. It was a, a mixture of uh, money being, uh, in principle, provided by the ESM, but also um, 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 easing certain provisions, for instance, in the sector of the structural funds, allowing uh, member states to use now uh, the remaining amount of money from the current MFF uh, for um, um, expenditures, for investments, uh, for costs uh, related to the COVID crisis. And this was also something which was very much welcomed by member states. On top of this, maybe also quite interesting for you is to know um, um, immediately after the outbreak, we looked into the, uh, at least, uh, I wouldn't say suspension, but uh, um, um, to a certain extent, uh, huge relaxation of state aid rules. But this has to be done always on a case-by-case -case, um, um, decision. And in that respect, um, you have uh, um, uh, introduced myself as a commissioner for budget and administration. So I'm also in charge of our around 32,000 uh, um, staff people. <clears throat> and I have to say already today, Everybody is more or less on teleworking. There's only a critical staff of around 4% of the overall staff uh, in office. And all these people have worked uh, from at home and um, uh, with no losses in terms of output. And since uh, uh, the outbreak, we have adopted uh, more than 1,000 uh, college decisions. And uh, out of them, around 390 only related to state aid um, 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 applications uh, in order to address the needs of member states. Something, by the way, quite interesting, uh, these 390 decisions amounting to a state aid of around um, 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 3 uh, billion, uh, no, 3 trillion, and um, out of this 3 trillion so far, only 15%, one five, have been activated by member states. So you see the difference between adopting uh, new measures and implementing. And this leads me, so to say, to the second part of my um, uh, introductory remarks. Uh, now it's about implementing everything. But first, because before we start implementing, we have to take the necessary decisions. 
In the meantime, I was member, I was part of the uh, negotiating team leading the uh, commission uh, delegation on the new MFF and also on this uh, famous rule of law issue. Uh, Council and uh, Parliament have concluded their negotiations by the beginning of November. And of course, you have seen that uh, two member states, Hungary and Poland, opposing this uh, rule of law mechanism. I have to stress, if you're talking about the rule of law mechanism, you're talking about something which is uh, merely related to, uh, so to say, uh, potential budgetary effects uh, uh, to the union budget if uh, in a member state, for instance, the judiciary is not independent and this lack of independence has an impact on the uh, use of European Union taxpayers' money. If there is a link, then of course it would be considered as a breach of uh, uh, the rule of law. And uh, this is something which uh, many pe people, including myself, believe is uh, something necessary. Uh, it is uh, not um, uh, dealing with the famous Article 7 in the treaty, but it's very much uh, focused and, uh, and concentrated on the budgetary implementation. I'm mentioning this because this has so far hampered uh, the adoption of the MFF. There have been already consultations amongst member states and all 27 member states are in favor about the result uh, concerning the financial uh, outcome, the MFF, including next generation EU. But indeed, there are two member states opposing this rule of law mechanism. As it was considered to be one package, we are working on a compromise, a compromise uh, which is not leading to a reopening of the agreement between Parliament and uh, Council on this so-called rule of law mechanism, but is going into the direction to give a sound interpretation how this mechanism would be applied and um, the Commission would also be ready uh, to present a proposal how the future methodology would look like and how this would, so to say, be conducted once it is in place and in case it's necessary uh, to use it. And also to reassure, of course, but this is should be uh, well understood that um, any kind of uh, decision, but already the regulation as such is, of course, subject uh, to a potential uh, uh, request uh, uh, to the court of auditors or to appeal uh, to the court of, uh, not auditors, uh, court of justice. So every decision taken by the commission and endorsed by member states can, of course, be challenged at uh, the court of justice. And the same applies for the regulations as such. So this should give each and everybody a kind of reassurance that there is not, if you like, an arbitrary element in it, but it, it follows a, a sound objective uh, procedure. I'm elaborating on this a little bit to better understand the situation. Of course, we're working on a um, compromise, which is good because it would then create the necessary ownership. But I also have to mention that uh, in principle, the adoption of the rule of law mechanism would only uh, demand a qualified majority amongst member states, which would be there. But of course, all the financial instruments uh, have, have to be um, uh, adopted unanimously by all member states. This is the issue. Uh, and uh, this also includes the so-called own resource decision, which leads me to the almost uh, final point of my um, introductory remarks. And this is how to finance, how to refinance the borrowing of the money. And here I'm talking uh, about the 390 billion. And uh, we have now proposed uh, for the first time since the 80s to introduce so-called new own resources, uh, new own resources, which might be um, sufficient enough uh, uh, to finance the 
capital, but also the interest. Here we're talking about around 16 billion per year in, in current prices. There is now um, a proposal on the table to limit the repayment period till 2058, and it, it should start um, at the latest in 2028. If, if possible, it could also start already earlier, meaning during the next multi-annual financial framework. Of course, uh, there is not yet a precise decision which new own resources should be introduced. The Commission, and this is also a result of this uh, outcome of negotiations, is invited, is tasked to come forward at the latest uh, mid of next year with a proposal of potential own resources. We have a range of uh, uh, candidates. Some have been explicitly mentioned, like a digital levy, a border, uh, a carbon border adjustment mechanism, uh, but also an extension of the ETS uh, auction system. Uh, but also some others are uh, possible in case the Commission consider them as interesting. I know that there are certain discussions and I was participating in an informal um, um, uh, ministerial conference, I think in summer this year, uh, at, at the invitation of the German presidency, where uh, Professor Fust with another uh, colleague uh, presented their ideas and reflections and assessment and uh, the outcome was that only ETS is the only, um, uh, let's say, realistic and potential new own resource. Uh, I have to say this, this uh, is one approach, but from a political point of view, I have to say we have to look at the package, which is, um, so to say, on the one hand, uh, pursuing our political priorities, again, climate change, and uh, fair taxation, digitalization. Uh, we have member states which are more affected by uh, potential new own resources which are related to the environment, to the climate change, and others which are more affected and exposed to um, potential uh, new own resources more related to the business sector. And in order to get a final acceptance and agreement. And again, for this, we need a unanimity. Uh, uh, we need to have uh, most likely a package and we cannot only rely to one single instrument uh, in order to get this only as an explanation also amongst experts why most likely we will propose a set of uh, new own resources. And then, of course, this has to be discussed, negotiated, but the idea is that uh, the first new own resources should come into force and create and generate uh, revenues in 2023. There might be a second uh, 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 proposal in 2024. Some political groups in the parliament have very much uh, lobbied and pressed uh, to come forward with an idea on a financial transaction tax. As you can see and follow the European-wide debate, um, um, it's not very promising, at least for the moment, but uh, you never know how things evolve. On the other hand, talking about, for instance, digital levy, you also, uh, we also have to see if the new um, uh, US administration will change their uh, view, their attitude uh, concerning uh, the idea to have an agreement, almost a global agreement, at least an agreement at the OECD level, in case this is not achievable, of course, we will go forward with the digital levy at the European level. So this is, so to say, the situation in general. Of course, what remains to be done is, of course, to get uh, this um, agreement. Uh, I am nevertheless confident this is a good Euro European tradition, sometimes in inverted commas, uh, to, to seal a deal and to strike a deal in the very last moment. So we have um, uh, a European Parliament plenary in the um, uh, week of uh, 14, 17, 18 of uh, December, and it is uh, possible and very realistic to get everything adopted there. 
then it could come into force uh, at the beginning of January. Of course, many sectoral programs have to be negotiated. And what is uh, very important also probably for you, of course, these so-called new own resources must be also um, ratified by all member states. And in 23 out of 27, we need uh, ratification by the respective national parliaments. So we hope this can be done uh, quite uh, fast so that uh, we can start the borrowing exercise uh, in the second uh, quarter, maybe towards the end of the second quarter uh, next year, and then we can start rolling out uh, this program. In parallel, member states have to submit so-called reform plans, which are also based on the European semester recommendations. Uh, this is already an ongoing process. First countries like Italy have already submitted first drafts. We are looking into this. Uh, we have to give an approval. Of course, this is also assessed by member states. And once uh, this is agreed, it can also come into place. This next generation EU should be there for the first three years, meaning in the first three years, member states have to make commitments how they intend to use, to spend the money, and then they have another three years to submit payment claims. So this is, if you like, uh, the overall package, and, and I'm happy to take um, your questions. Um, uh, maybe a last comment, because yesterday we had, uh, uh, at least for this year, the last uh, uh, issuance of uh, uh, sure bonds, so-called social bonds, aiming to support member states in their needs to address uh, the unemployment or the employment situation and to help in particular those member states uh, which don't have uh, uh, short time employment schemes in place or other similar programs. And uh, uh, now in November, we have uh, issued in three tranches uh, altogether almost 40 billions and the uh, direction of the capital market was an excellent one. There was always an oversubscription of uh, 12 to 17 times. Uh, also yesterday, 12.5 times we raised 8 billions and uh, we have so far supported or will support uh, or provide uh, 15 member states uh, with the necessary um, financial support. Altogether, 18 member states have asked uh, to use this uh, instrument and this gives us quite a um, um, lot of confidence and reassurance that even the bigger chunk of this 750 will be a success. By the way, 30% out of this 750 should be so-called green bonds. Also, this is another proof that we try to combine, uh, so to say, the, the raising of money with our political priorities and direction at the capital market is a very reassuring one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner, for, for these insights. Now we have a couple of minutes to discuss a few questions among the two of us, and then we will bring, on, uh, bring in questions from the audience. I would like to start um, with the rule of law question. Now we don't want to get, get very deep into this, but from an economic policy perspective, of course, there is a worry that the recovery fund may be held up and the money may arrive maybe later because these negotiations are going Going on. Uh, so uh, if I understand you correctly, you, what you emphasize is that this is not about the very general debate of rule of law and, and, and national institutions, but really related to rule of law questions uh, uh, close or concerned by the implementation of the budget, which is, a, I suppose, a narrower approach. But uh, still, uh, if these negotiations are dragging on, uh, so there has been a debate about maybe taking a different approach and acting with 25 countries. This would, of course, be you know something very big and uh, probably also controversial. But uh, what is your assessment of this? Is uh, would you say this is irrelevant? It's an option. It's likely. Is it possible at all? Well, in a in a nutshell, I would say it's a theoretical option, uh, but in, in reality, it, it would it would be um, highly problematic. And if you see the reactions uh, 
this was, uh, I think, mentioned by Prime Minister Rutte and also um, uh, from the French corner and has heard something similar. But may I say many other member states are against it because it would only complicate uh, things. Uh, it, it's not so easy. Uh, and uh, the setup of it, it would be a new instrument. So it would really delay everything. And I think also the, the reaction of the capital market would be, uh, uh, I don't want to say a disastrous one, but uh, uh, so, and again, I, I'm confident, of course, we, we had hoped uh, to get everything approved during this uh, plenary week of the European Parliament, but uh, uh, already last time, the normal MFF was adopted on the 13th of December. So uh, from a uh, planning point of view, of course, we would like to have seen it earlier adopted, but it is uh, a tradition in, in the Union, but probably not only in the Union, to take the decision at a, at a very um, a late uh, moment. Again, I'm confident that we get it done. And uh, I think it's important at the end of the day to have everybody on board, also to have the necessary ownership. I'm here confident that the German presidency is successful in reaching um, a deal. Thank you. Let us turn to the to the recovery fund. As you emphasize this, the idea is that this will be mostly directed towards investment, not just for the recovery, but also for resilience. Now, uh, I, and you also mentioned that the member states are now submitting their recovery programs. So that is plans, how they intend to use the funds and how they intend to invest. Now, one concern is that uh, the uh, European money coming in here may not lead to additional in investment, but just replace national money. So money is fungible. And what uh, member states could do in principle is say, okay, you know, due to the crisis, we are lacking the money to do investments. They could withdraw national funds and replace it by European funds. Uh, and in the end, there would be little additional investment. Uh, so is... Uh, is the European Commission looking into this? I, supp I suppose the, the, the political objective of the, Euro of the Commission is to have additional investment, to have higher investments, maybe also different investments, as you said, in line with European priorities. So um, how, how does this work? Will you look into the recovery plans and check whether this investment is really additional or, or how, how is this going to work? Well, uh, this is uh, <clears throat> the more um, um, challenging issue. What we try to achieve is uh, uh, indeed that it's not only, um, uh, let's say, um, filling the, the loopholes of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, budgets and public households, but really great investments. And therefore, 37% uh, 37% of the recovery and resilience fund should be invested in uh, green deal related investments and 20% uh, should be digital. Of course, if you take smart cities as an example, <clears throat> there could be a kind of uh, double counting, but the essential thing is indeed to have um, real investments. And of course, it should also be accompanied by some potentially necessary regulatory measures because uh, this is the reason why we are referring to the European semester recommendations. And if you look in, in the, into the European semester recommendations, many of them are of um, um, regulatory nature. And I think if we want to stimulate uh, investments in, in countries, in many countries, maybe one has also to look into the regulatory uh, situation if certain adaptations are needed to make uh, investments, uh, domestic, but also international investments, more attractive <clears throat> to stimulate, to motivate people uh, to invest. And uh, this is uh, what we like to achieve. Of course, uh, ideally, we would see also national money to be used uh, for investments. And I hope in many cases, it will be a kind of intelligent uh, planning. <clears throat> but I have to say, in general, it will be for many member states 
a huge challenge and for public administrations to absorb the available amount of money in an um, intelligent, smart, meaningful, sustainable manner and respecting the rules of the games. I was, as you mentioned uh, in, in, in introducing me in my first mandate, Commissioner for Structural Funds, and I have some knowledge about uh, these uh, challenges and in some countries, unfortunately, may I say, these challenges have not really changed since I left uh, this office in 2014. Right. So, so maybe looking uh, looking ahead, uh, let's say five years, um, what would you consider a, a success of this whole fund initiative? So under which circumstances would you say, yes, it was a good thing to do, it was a success, and uh, maybe alternatively, in uh, under which circumstances would you say, this did not work out as we intended. What are the what are the risks you think about? First, I think it's important that we can prove that uh, the money provided is really used and is uh, not uh, um, unused. Uh, second, it's indeed the uh, the question how this money has been um, uh, has been um, uh, so to say used in the way I have just described according our political priorities. Of course, then we have to see uh, what is uh, the effect also on the level of competitiveness of our member states, because this is also something we have to keep in mind that uh, we are exposed to an even uh, tougher global competition. Uh, and uh, so they, this crisis should also be used to, to make our member states, our business sectors, more uh, competitive, more resilient. Uh, and then we have to see if uh, these goals have uh, been achieved. Another issue, I have to admit here, we are rather at the beginning of uh, the whole, uh, if, if I may say so, a reflection process is the question of uh, um, European sovereignty. Some call it uh, um, 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 European autonomy, uh, because in some countries the issue of sovereignty has a different meaning. Uh, but the issue is uh, simply, I mean, now everybody is looking at the, uh, the, um, the availability of certain medicines and the dependency on uh, certain countries to get it uh, delivered. And this uh, triggers some uh, ideas that we should do it on our own. But like always in life, uh, things are all a little bit complicated and uh, it's not only about medicine. If we are talking about uh, research, uh, which is very close to my heart, I think uh, we are in a global competition when it comes to uh, the development uh, and the research work on artificial intelligence, quantum computing, etc. So it's not only about uh, the crisis itself, but also to see uh, uh, how we manage the next decade and uh, what necessary decisions and investments have to be taken uh, to make um, uh, Europe and uh, further fit for the future. <clears throat> and of course, then we have to see uh, about the effects. Um, uh, I hope we can see already in five years very concrete um, uh, effects, but uh, I think important is uh, uh, to be aware about uh, the direction and um, again uh, here, by the way, I have to say <clears throat> I'm rather, um, how to say, there's a lot of expectation <clears throat> on the European side about the new US administration, for instance, when it comes to fight um, uh, the climate change, which again has an impact on uh, the economic opportunities also of Europe. So I think it's a whole set of uh, issues but uh, in principle, I think the main issue is to make, uh, in particular, the more vulnerable economies, uh, uh, so say, more resilient, and uh, this means help them to become more competitive. Thank you. Now, uh, let's bring in a few questions from the audience. There are quite some questions now, and that means over to you, Monica. 
Well, thank you, uh, Clement. And uh, obviously, we were listening all. I mean, this was a very uh, interesting discussion there, but I believe uh, that Commissioner Han only has uh, 10 minutes left for us. So uh, I'll try to get as many questions uh, passed on to you, Commissioner, as possible, starting straight away with a very urgent one uh, coming from Dr. Kurt uh, Geisert, a uh, guide in the House of European History. And he wants to know when will money from the recovery fund start to arrive in Italy? Um, as soon as all member states have ratified, we can start borrowing. And if everything goes well, it should uh, already be before summer break. Because um, you mentioned earlier, I think in your keynote, uh, February 2021 could sort of be the beginning of it. Uh, so now we're back in the in the summer break now. No, the issue is uh, if we have now uh, the, the adoption of uh, everything at the European level, for this uh, borrowing exercise at the capital market, I need the ratification of it by all the 27 member states. And in 23 out of 27 member states, we need it to uh, be done by the national parliaments. In some countries, by the two chambers, in some countries, only by one chamber. So this is, to a certain extent, uh, a little bit a cumbersome process. But I understand all member states are more or less eager to get their fair share from this recovery and resilience uh, fund. And therefore, I'm confident that uh, different to previous experiences, this time it will be faster. But a realistic uh, timeline is the one I have uh, uh, just sketched out. All right. Then we'll move on to another question from, and I hope I pronounced the name correctly, Ion Imbrescu. Uh, he wants to know, as we observed, there were significant differences between the amounts proposed by the European Commission in May 2020 for next generation EU, comparing with the amounts resulted after European Council summit in July 2020. Can you tell us what are the main causes of these differences? Yeah, if he um, 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 refers to the discussions about um, uh, grants and loans, of course, uh, the original pro uh, uh, proposal of the Commission was 500 billion in uh, for grants. And then, of course, uh, some member states, in particular the famous frugal ones, have uh, um, so they, their position was at the beginning of the negotiations. No grants, only loans. Uh, this is, of course, not very helpful for all our member states. And so at the end of the day, I think there was a, a, a feasible and uh, acceptable compromise between the grant and the loan element. So we will have now 300. And then, of course, in order to make this uh, compromise possible, feasible and realistic, the overall amount of this 500 was extended to 750. And then there could be the split in, of this 750. By the way, here I'm talking about 2018 prices. Uh, this 750 split in 360 for loans and 390 for this uh, grant element. And out of this 390, 312.5 will be allocated to member states according a pre-agreed um, allocation key which will be reviewed after two years and uh, for the remaining uh, last year in 2023. Right, then uh, we should be able to get two more questions in at this rate. Uh, Pierre Raffi wants to know what impact will the burden of repayment have on the feasibility of the EU climate goals as currently defined by the EU Commission? Will there realistically be a moratorium for the one or other goal like repayment, climate, etc.? There were some breaks in the connection, but uh, I hope I could understand you. Um, uh, it's about the impact of our initiative on the on the global climate goals, correct? The EU climate goals. Yeah, in particular. on the EU climate goals, uh, I, I think there will be certainly a huge impact uh, because there are different other, so to say, sub-elements of programs like the Just Transition Mechanism, which should help uh, in particular those regions, but maybe also uh, uh, business sectors uh, to uh, change their technologies in order to be less CO2 
uh, intensive or even to arrive at uh, zero uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, and therefore, I think the impact on the European climate goals will be huge. But important is that uh, we are successfully spearheading a global change. And of course, here we need the support of uh, many others. And that's why I was referring uh, to the new US administrations and our expectations in that respect. Right, and then, Commissioner Hahn, I have a question here that uh, arrived already uh, yesterday. That people had the chance to already submit questions beforehand, and as somebody was so early, I would like to bring it in, even though it goes in a completely different direction. No, not quite completely. Uh, Dr. Hans Schleicher wants to know what is the estimated annual revenue from a future CO2 border adjustment levy on imports into the EU? Good question. Uh, uh, probably he was referring to first, first very um, um, general assessment. Of course, this instrument would be a very, uh, would be a very, um, uh, let's say, would be rather difficult to set it up and um, uh, challenging. And that's why um, any precise indications are uh, premature because it depends on the potential scope uh, of it, for instance, then of course we have to see uh, to which extent it is and it has to be uh, WTO compatible uh, and um, all this has to be taken into account. So there is a range, uh, but this is a, a very rough estimation <clears throat> between four and 14 billions. But again, this is subject to a thorough assessment and this is by the way one of the reasons why we are only able to come forward with a very concrete elaborated proposal on new own resources by mid of next year. Our teams, our respective experts already, already working on it. I cannot guarantee that we make a, a, a proposal for each and everything because uh, at the end of the day, this assessment could also lead to the, uh, so the decision on our side to replace it by others. But in any case, we have been tasked uh, by the Council and also by the Parliament uh, to come forward with a proposal, with an assessment, and this takes its time to be um, uh, to be really um, um, elaborated in a way that it's uh, it's uh, possible to discuss it and to to take a decision on the basis of the proposal. Right, Commissioner, there are uh, several more questions and I'm picking one that is the shortest uh, and it's up to you if you're done by a quarter to two. Uh, mm -hmm. In addition to ex post transfers between countries and EU budget, would it not be also useful to consider ex ante tax harmonization measures? That's a question from Antonia Afonso. Look, this is, uh, I wouldn't say a never ending story, but uh, as you know, this is um, something where we need to uh, uh, unanimity again, and uh, uh, I think uh, what is realistic is a certain benchmark uh, of uh, of uh, taxes of the same category amongst member states. But uh, it is certainly an issue which will stay with us, and uh, there are some uh, EU internal discussions on this. But uh, I think uh, to have it ex ante is. Uh, for the time being, if we like it or not, unrealistic. Well, then, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Hahn. It is exactly uh, 1 45 uh, p.m. Central European time, and uh, I believe this is the time that you have to leave this conference due to other commitments. But thank you so much for your time uh, and for your uh, insights that you shared with us. Uh, I can it was see a pleasure, and I'm, I'm ready to answer in, 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 in writing. Uh, additional questions which we could not answer. Well, we take you up on that word because a uh, few more questions came in, uh, several ones, and uh, we're happy to forward them to you, obviously. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you. Greetings from Brussels. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. So, and I can see that, uh, obviously, Clemens Hust is still here with us. Um, we have a little bit of time left uh, before we wanted to take a break, so perhaps uh, can I just refer very briefly to you, Clemens Bruce, as the host, uh, and because uh, there, there was one question, uh, and I'm not expecting you to give me the answer that I wanted to hear from Commissioner Hahn. Uh, 
but uh, he was uh, touching on, upon you know various issues of of debt level of basically having to refinance those uh, 390 uh, billion euros uh, borrowing money all for this uh, rescue fund and uh, uh, in, in addition he mentioned obviously the uh, the state aid rules fiscal rules being suspended uh, so we see debt levels on a national level rising uh, obviously the EU needs to borrow money um, this part, you know the whole conference having this word sustainable in it how sustainable is all this borrowing and rising debt levels I understand that we have to counter the current crisis but how sustainable is it from an econo uh, economist's point of view I think that's a key question and uh, uh, the, the the main problem here probably is that we have very different situations in different member states. So in especially as we know in 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 the so-called northern countries, debt levels are still relatively low, uh, at least in international comparison. So um, the uh, the sustainability issue isn't at the forefront. We have very low interest rates currently. So um, uh, this is feasible. In particular, I think in the in the short term, if we think about the short term, investors are looking for uh, safe places where to put their money and they like government bonds at least until now the the, the, the more critical question is what is the medium term uh, and what do the highly indebted countries do and if we look at countries like Italy we, we need to see that they will come out of this crisis with debt to GDP ratios like 160 percent and the commissioner just said the next crisis will be coming and he also emphasized the resilience issue which is maybe a variant of sustainability so the question is, how resilient can a country be with uh, that kind of debt level? Uh, now, I, I think someone in the chat uh, suggested uh, that maybe some of the money uh, raised now at the EU level could be used, in fact, not for additional investments, but to reduce those very high debt levels. And I think this relates to the more fundamental question of what this fund really is. Uh, so uh, it, I, I personally think it's uh, it, it's too bad the commissioner cannot answer this question, but <laughs> I, I think it's, it's important to broaden this debate, really. Maybe this fund is also not just an investment fund, but also an insurance device or a solidarity device where, yeah. yes, some member states give money to others and help them uh, also to uh, reduce their debt levels. Getting all this money, the commissioner said that, and I think it's a very important point, Getting spending all this money well now in investments is a big challenge. So maybe you know we should save some of it and um, uh, bring it back in later. Saving, saving is always a good thing if you uh, uh, can afford uh, to do so. Um, obviously, I don't want to, to put you on the line, and I, again, I do not expect uh, a, a, an answer where we say this is written in stone. It's actually not 100% uh, uh, serious, but we were, uh, you know, the G20 have just sort of agreed to uh, huge debt relief uh, for emerging economies, poorer countries, uh, certainly against the backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic, that they are actually capable of, of handling it better. Um, Again, European debt levels, national le debt levels, uh, is it feasible that one day uh, at least uh, some European uh, member states uh, would also receive a kind of uh, uh, debt relief? Something that, for example, we haven't seen in, in past crises. There were all the, always other mechanisms in place. Uh, but uh, do you think it's possible due to this pandemic right now and uh, this unprecedented uh, financial crisis that also goes along with the economic crisis, uh, that that could maybe be a step in the future that we might see? Well, it's it's a tricky issue. In fact, we have experience with that in the EU with the case of Greece in the financial crisis. And I think debt relief has always two sides. So it's good for the debtor in principle, uh, because uh, you have the debt overhang and it's a burden on the future and on, on economic recovery. So it would be nice to bring down this debt at the same time, uh, someone has to pay for it. Uh, and uh, there is a danger that the capital markets get scared if people lose their money. And if we think 
back uh, to, to the Greek case. I think in Greece, we uh, didn't do it very well. So we did scale the capital market, but we did not achieve a lot of debt relief for Greece if we look into the details. So I suppose if we do this again, we have to make sure that uh, yes, maybe you know, if, if private investors lose money, they, they, they lose money, but then we should at least really get the debt down to sustainable levels. What we shouldn't repeat is uh, scare capital markets and uh, achieve very little. Uh, again, I think this is very, uh, a very tricky thing. And uh, we also need to face the fact that our banks are heavily invested in government bonds still, uh, especially in the highly debted countries. And we all know if we want to do these things, uh, restructure government debt and let private investors pay, we need to change our banking system. And this is one of of the open questions in the eurozone who is going to pay for all this debt um, uh, I, I think you know the solution i mean some people think the ecb could make it disappear that's real nonsense so uh, i think it's important to to remind that because the, the you know if the ecb holds debt the government the, 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 the state owes it to itself so it doesn't help to to, to forget about that uh, it's a it's a very tricky issue but it's probably one we will have to address once this uh, crisis is more or less behind us. Right. Well, uh, Clay Mofus, then uh, I would say uh, thank you. And uh, obviously you stay with us because you're the host, you can't go away. Um, <laughs> but uh, we will uh, take a break uh, because uh, at a quarter past two, we expect a, a really you know, stellar panel. We have uh, Agnes benesti Kerry, Chief Economist of the French Treasury here with us. We have uh, Ivan Pagliella, Senior Economist of the Bank of Italy with us. Uh, Dr. Jörg Kukis, uh, the State Secretary for Financial Market Policy and European Policy at the Federal Ministry for Finance, or, or of Finance here in Germany with us. And we have uh, Piroska nagy Mohashe. I hope I pronounce this correctly. If not, then she can reprimand me and correct me later on. And she is interim director of LSE's Institute of Global Affairs. And uh, we will have a good hour starting at a quarter past two. We will have a good hour to look at balancing new challenges, sustainable and inclusive growth for Europe. First of all, obviously defining what those new challenges are from the various perspectives, what measures are already underway, which measures should be taken, how they can be financed and what may have to be uh, uh, take a take a back seat uh, due to to other urgent issues. All of those questions uh, we will explore again with you. You know now how it works. Uh, the FA or QA button at the bottom of the screen is very easy to find, uh, and I'm very happy to to bring your questions in as uh, as soon as they arrive. So uh, don't get upset, our web master will close the session now and uh, the participants, everybody who joins us now, you can rejoin definitely by a quarter past two Central European time um, and I look forward to see you there.